All right, we are back with another My Hero Monday, and I tell you what, this episode was so freaking good. We finally get the payoff to what we saw at the end of the last episode, and let's just get right into it. So like we saw at the end of the last episode, we have Deku and Mirio going out and patrolling, and so they're in one group, and then you have Sir Night Eye and Bubble Girl in another group, and we're following Mirio and Deku, and it was actually kind of funny. So we finally learn what Mirio's uh, hero name is, which is Lemillion, which actually really speaks to how he's optimistic but realistic, which I like, because it's Lemillion because he wants to save, that's how many people he wants to save, but he knows that you can't save everyone, and that actually really goes to show his either experience or, or realism with his scenario of being a hero, but also realizing that there are people out there who are just unable to be saved, like cannot be saved because he can't be everywhere at once. So I actually really liked that little detail. That's pretty wild to think that, you know, as energetic and as hyper, but still kind of laid back as he is, he's very realistic and, and he, he's well thought out in a lot of ways. Now we didn't have to wait like at all for the payoff for what we saw at the end of last episode because we of course had the point where Eri runs out and bumps into Deku and then here comes Overhaul. And it was actually pretty crazy to think that like that's how quickly they're just gonna have it kick right off, but we obviously have a lot more to cover with that. So right off the bat, when Deku goes to reach for Aerie and ask if she's all right, if he can help her up, Overhaul comes walking out and Deku looks horrified. Like he, he's horrified and he's also very like, he almost looks like he's getting ready to fight him kind of deal. But And it shows how with the way that Class 1A in general, but specifically Deku and the group he tends to work with, they're very reckless. They're not very like, forward thinking when it comes to their fight strategies, they don't tend to really go about the best options when it comes to dealing with, with villains, because their initial reaction has always been to fight, which I you can't really blame them for that, because every time they've had to deal with any sort of, like, any kind of scenario where there's a villain, they end up having to fight. So, on patrol and in an investigation, that really isn't something they can do, or rather he can do. And with that, Lemillion Mirio picks it up and we see that he's actually pretty confident dealing with dangerous criminals. It's kind of wild. So without even a second thought, Mirio throws Deku's hood up over his face and it's like, oh, that mask keeps falling off so that, you know, Overhaul can't see that Deku is horrified. And he just talks to Overhaul casually asking, you know, like, oh, or telling him, oh, you're part of the Hisaikai or whatever. So you're, you're pretty big around this area and, and that kind of stuff and tries to play it casual to keep to keep Overhaul from getting suspicious about what they're doing or like uh, keep them from, you know, thinking, oh, boy, they're asking way too many questions. So he's he's a natural when it comes to this stuff, or at least he has a lot more experience than Deku does. Now, what doesn't help is the fact that Eri is kind of clinging to Deku and, tr and trembling. She's clearly very horrified of whatever Overhaul was doing to her. And on top of that, we also have Deku asking questions and, and making Overhaul more and more and more suspicious. And finally, like when, when Deku keeps asking questions, Deku, and, and you can tell as the viewer, you kind of want him to play along with what Mirio is doing because you want this to go smoothly. And it's not going to go smoothly if Deku keeps prodding and prying and prodding and prying. And with Deku being such an aspiring hero, trying to help everyone. And this is the contrast that I saw between Mirio and Deku. Deku wants to save everybody. So when he sees somebody like Eri in that much stress, in that duress, in that kind of trouble, Mirio realizes he can't save everybody and he needs to be patient to help Eri. Like waiting is not good for her in the short term, but significantly better in the long term. Deku wants to deal with it in the short term, which is very bad and can jeopardize everything that they're trying to do. And Overhaul plays it off like Aerie is his daughter, and with this we have sort of the blaming it on children having temper tantrums sort of thing, 
and he was very clearly ready to get violent with uh, with the with these two because he takes them back in an alley. And he's like, "Can we talk quietly? You know, in a place where it's you know easily we can easily talk quietly." And as they're walking back, he says, "You know, children never do what you want them to," and starts taking his glove off. And Aerie sees that, and in order to keep, I guess, Overhaul from demolishing these two, um, yeah, he. Uh, <laughs> He was ready to kill them, but in order to keep him from doing that, Eri runs from Deku and goes up to Overhaul, and they, they leave. So, yeah, and, and Mirio picked up on the fact that he was ready to get violent, and Deku, being Deku, was completely oblivious to that because he just wanted to save Eri. And now we see the long-term effects that that has on him as we go further and further on with these episodes, or not further on with the episodes, further on with in this very episode. You know, I script this sometimes and I still have issues reading it, but we see it affect him further and further on in this episode because he starts having issues in class, he can't focus, he's just out of it. And we kind of see that Eri is going to be part of a much bigger plan with Overhaul because he has some sort of setup. I don't exactly know what the plan he has with Eri is, but apparently the one dude got away, <laughs> or let her get away rather, and um, yeah, he blew him up against a wall. Um, and apparently with what they were talking about later in this episode, there was a car crash involving Overhaul, but everything that was wrong with the criminals who were involved, everything wrong with them was gone, which we saw at the end of last season that he dismantled everybody. Like, they were melded into the car and into the ground and all that stuff, and they were fine after that. So my, I'm wondering if his ability is, like, disassembly and reassembly of, of people. I don't know. He reminds me a lot of, like, what Scar could do back with Full Metal Alchemist, where you could, like, touch people and, like, blow them to pieces. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that's part of what he's got, like, if that's part of what his quirk is. Either way, once they meet back up with Sir Night Eye and Bubble Girl, they trade the information that they gave, they kind of debrief each other, and Deku very clearly is still focused in on wanting to, to help Eri, and Sir Night Eye scolds him and tells him, you cannot be reckless, you cannot be reckless, which is correct, he can't be reckless in the way that he kind of wants to be reckless. So uh, I think Sir Night Eye is very realistic, which is a good thing, but also not uh, forgiving. Um, and we find out partly why he's so against heroes who are reckless. And we see that Deku and his recklessness and his wanting to save everyone is one of the things that probably seriously convinced All Might into giving Deku one for all. And also, and this didn't really get paid off much, but we also have the League of Villains calling up the uh, Yakuza and getting a hold of Overhaul to, I guess, say under the right conditions they'll meet up. We get a bit of that at the middle of the episode, and then we get the rest of it at the end of the episode. And there was really not much about it other than it looks like we're finally getting, or rather, uh, Overhaul is finally getting some level of the grounds and the terms that he wanted from the League of Villains, so I guess we'll see how that pays off later, but as of right now, it was just sort of hinted at. And in the classroom, which this was great, because we have Todoroki and we have Bakugo taking the, the exams, like trying to get the, the hero course, or getting their, their hero permits, trying to get those, <laughs> and just getting the crap beat out of them in the classes, because apparently it's a fairly hard class. Now, once we get through seeing Deku struggling in these classes, and, and falling behind, and having all of this stuff on his mind, we have, well, he comes to the resolution that he needs to talk to All Might and kind of get the information that he doesn't have so that he knows why why things are the way they are right now between him and between Sir Night Eye and why All Might does not want to talk to Sir Night Eye. And it's actually quite a similarity that, like, there's a lot of similarities that you see with Deku and All Might, but there's one thing that All Might saw, I guess, in Deku that was also present with Sir Night Eye. So All Might didn't want to take on any sort of, of sidekicks, and he took on Sir Night Eye because Sir Night Eye was such a huge fan, and he, especially because he was a fan, he didn't want to take on, you know, a sidekick like that. But they worked pretty well together, and at the point where we see sort of the aftermath of what happened with All for One and One for All, the All Might versus All for One fight. And apparently that was when, or that was still when Sir Night Eye was the sidekick of All Might. 
and man, oh man. And seeing All Might in the aftermath of this fight, like he, he can't smile, he can barely walk, he's covered in bandages, his hair's all messed up, and uh, we have the main characters who already knew about All Might's abilities, um, we have them there, and we have <laughs> Sir Night-Eye telling him, you need to pass on your quirk, you need to, you need to find a successor, and soon, because you can't keep fighting in this form. If you keep fighting in this form, it's just going to do more damage in the long run, and you you will die. And we have, of course, Nezu saying, well, why don't you go and look for, you know, somebody at UA? And when All Might refuses, he's like, you know, I need to keep fighting. Who's going to, you know, who's going to fight while this, like, his thoughts and his methods on heroism have never changed from the start of this series onward. Um, but even with that, he doesn't want to take a break, and he's pretty much just been going strong, strong for as long, as long as he could. And what made Sir Night Eye and All Might like go their separate ways was that All Might wanted con to continue as he was while searching for a successor. He wanted to continue being a hero and not stopping until he could find a successor. And Sir Night Eye wanted him to stop. Period and just focus on finding a successor. And with that, we have the sort of conflict between the two of them and why they don't talk anymore. And it, we also have Sir Night Eye using Foresight on All Might. And with him using Foresight on All Might, he sees farther out into the future. So I guess you can... So his quirk is actually really different than what I initially thought. Because they told us that it was only an hour into the future, but from what I could put together, he can see exactly what's going to happen an hour into the future, but the further out he looks, the less clear that vision becomes. But he was very much convinced that All Might would die to a gruesome death to another villain, and we don't know if that's true. Uh, we don't know if he's already changed that because Deku has changed, and All Might even says Deku's changed a lot of what All Might was and his his you know thought process, the way that he is. He Deku has changed that because he's such a different character, such a different young like his thoughts on heroism are so similar but very different to All Might's. I'd love to get into a character study on Deku and a character study on All Might. Like that would actually be pretty interesting. Let me know if you guys want me to do like a character study breakdown on these on these characters. And so with all of that being dumped on Deku, we now know that All Might has been basically living full steam ahead until the very end because he pretty much just assumes that at some point, yeah, he's going to die. And it dawns on Deku, yeah, All Might could die. And with that realization, Deku wants to change the future, wants to change fate, wants to wants to change what's happened. And he might even, you know, have changed it already, and we don't know, because he thought, All Might thought that the fight with All for One was going to be the end of, of everything, like, was going to be the end of his fight. Um, but he survived, which could mean it would have changed it. But All Might even says he didn't want to give this information to Deku because he was a fan. And that really speaks to... All Might wanting to protect and, and respect his fans, but with All Might choosing Deku as a successor, I feel like he should definitely share more information with him than what he has been. And that is probably something that, with this episode, will probably change, because now All Might knows that he can't go and just hide things from his successor. He needs to treat him like his successor, like somebody trying to become his equal, rather than somebody who is just a fan with his powers. Oh yeah, and the fact that uh, All Might chose Deku was pretty much what sealed the deal on putting All Might and Sir Night Eye on no speaking terms whatsoever. So that was that was kind of the final nail in the coffin for them talking. And I just love how in the inspirational speech at the very end of, of wanting to continue on and, and all that, like I love how All Might does his best to bring himself back up into his muscle form in some way using like whatever little bit of all for one or one for all is left 
to smile again and, and, and encourage Deku and, and show how much Deku has actually changed All Might. Like, this, this episode is really cool in that way as well. Like, character development has always been a strong suit for this show. But then after all of this, Deku just has the, like, well, why don't we have him use foresight on you again? Like, why don't we just do that? Then we'll know for sure. Like, why not? But, uh, and then he's going to try to bargain with Sir Night Eye, but I guarantee you that's not going to go very well because Sir Night Eye does not want to talk to All Might, especially after what's happened. So, yeah. And, and the fact that Deku only now knows why Sir Night Eye thinks, thinks about Deku, thinks of Deku as he does with, you know, thinking that All Might chose wrong. Like, now we know why. And it's almost more tragic and more frustrating. So we'll just see how the rest of, of that plays out. Overall, though, I actually really liked this episode for the fact that we get to see Mirio in his hero costume, though I'm wondering how his hero costume is going to work, considering every time he activates his uh, permeation quirk, his clothes fall off, so I don't know how that's going to work, though. In the episode, or in the opening, I think they show him using his quirk and, and the suit stays on, so I don't know how that's going to work. I guess we'll find out later. But I like seeing his hero methods. I like seeing how how professional and how experienced he seems with, with hero work like that. And I also love that we have more information than we've ever had about All Might and why he has been the way he's been. We see what separated Sir Night Eye and All Might. Like, we get so much story and so much character development and, and backstory. It's great. And I, I hope the rest of the season keeps going like this because, man, I... I'm loving every minute of it. My Hero Academia has never really disappointed, except for, like, the openings with, like, Peace Sign and the the other one from Overworld. But otherwise, I have loved every minute of this episode, and I just want to see more of that on and on and on. So hopefully that's what we get. Either way, hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Check out the links in the description. And apart from that, um, yeah, go watch the episode legally over on Funimation if you haven't seen it already. And I will see you all in the next episode. Please make sure to be there. Please make sure to be there because I'm trying to just keep this rolling. Make sure to be there and have a good one. Hey guys, just hopping in at the end here. Thanks for watching through the whole video. I hope you enjoyed it. I do still have merch. I've actually had it for quite a while, but not a lot of people know about it or care. And so if you guys want to support me or check it out just because it looks cool, go to the link in the description. You can see some of the designs I have, like the Steel Frodo in Steinsgate design, or even the Mob Psycho 100 design. And Maybe even buy one if you like it, or don't. I cried myself to sleep at night anyway, so either way guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching again, and I'll see you in the next one.